first thing that we talked about yesterday, first um, theorem. Um, let's see was that the remainder is the same as the function value. And that was what we called the remainder theorem. So that gave us two ways to determine whether or not we had a factor. We could divide to see if the remainder was 0, or we could just plug in the point and see whether or not we got 0. If we got 0, it was on the x-axis. So clearly that's a solution, an x-intercept, a root, whatever you want to call it. Then there was the factor theorem, and the factor theorem said this. Kind of related, if the function value is 0, then that's a factor. And if that's a factor, then the function value is 0. And then we ran into this one. Okay, The number of real zeros. So how many zeros there could possibly be? And it couldn't be more than the degree of the polynomial. It could be up to and including that, but couldn't go past that. And then there was the rational zeros theorem, and that was the P and Q stuff, Q and P stuff. All you need to keep straight is that first one's Q, the last one's P. It's much more wordy and looks much worse than it is. These last two help us know how many we're looking for. And if we're going to find some, let's find the nice ones first, right? Any questions? Okay. So let's go through and just remind ourselves. We went through and we listed the possible rational zeros. Okay. On this one, it just said check to see whether or not it's a factor. And we did that using um, the remainder theorem. And again, I said... If you don't remember the names, that's fine. As long as you've got the ideas down, um, then you should be okay. This one was another one that said list. And this is problem number 40. And notice it says list them, list the possible rational zeros. Don't attempt to find them. So don't figure out which ones work. And then on 46, we actually went through and we did one that says use the rational zeros theorem to find all the real zeros of that polynomial and then use it to factor it. So you've got to find all the factors and all the zeros, or vice versa. Find the zeros, and then you know what the factors are. Okay? And what was the last vocabulary word we learned? Depressed, depressed polynomial. And what was the depressed polynomial? The divorce on the stack. Okay, wow. <laughs> Polygamous, divorced, all that sort of stuff. Okay, it got busted down from degree 3. It now has to start off at degree 2. So here was our degree 3 polynomial. The quotient is degree 2 because it's one degree less. We call it a depressed polynomial. The point here is if you find the depressed polynomial, and that's why we like doing division to figure out whether or not it's a factor, because this stuff right here is the depressed polynomial, and it's usually easier to work with. Okay, We don't want to say, hey, 1 works, and then go back and work with this big, long, ugly, ugly polynomial. Okay, let's work with the depressed polynomial. Okay, any questions? All right, so this is number 57. You have problems with instructions just like this. It says solve the equation over the real number system. It doesn't say factor, although we're going to do that anyway, just out of habit. Okay, we want to solve for all the real zeros. Okay, in other words, find out where this crosses the x-axis. Now, the first thing we'd look at, and the easiest thing to tell is, how many places could this possibly cross the x-axis in? Four. Same as the degree. Same as the degree. It's not the number of turning points. It's the number of real zeros it can have. It can have up to and including the degree. This is a degree four polynomial, so it can have up to four. Okay? Now, let's run through here. If we're going to find four of them or two of them, let's say there's only two of them. But if we're going to find them, which ones do we want to find first? The easiest one, the nice ones. And nice ones are rational ones, right? So either fractions or, do I have to ask Clayton again? Integers. And what are integers, Marissa? Positive and negative whole numbers, including zero. Positive and negative whole numbers, including zero. Okay? So we're going to find the nice ones first. So I'm going to write down what P is, and I'm going to write down what Q is. And I'll just remind you of, you know, we, we kind of skipped a little bit of work, not too much. P is 8, Q is 1. We look at that and then we think, hey, this is great. Because if I go through and I list 1 and 2 and 4 and 8, the only factors of 1 are 1. So if I do each one of those over 1, I get the same number. All I need to do is put a plus or minus in front of those. I have a question. Yes. Um, so since there's only 4, can you just have that as our answer? Or because it's plus or minus, we have to slide the negative in 
Okay, well, okay, so there are eight all together. You with me? Yeah. Plus, so there are eight all together. So they can't all possibly work. We're saying we're looking for four, and we got four rational zeros here, but are these the only answers that, hold on, that's not, not yet, okay? This is from yesterday, okay? Are these the only answers that are possible? They're the only rational ones. They're the only nice ones that are possible, but we could get some ugly ones like two plus radical three, okay, that wouldn't be on this list. We're hoping that that's not the case. And this one said real numbers. We're going to have to find them all. These are just the nice ones. You with me there? Okay. All right. What one do you want to check first? Let's check one. Now, I mentioned yesterday that there's an easy way to check and see whether or not one's going to work without going through and doing synthetic division. And that's by plugging in a 1. So that would be a 1 minus 1. That's 0. Plus 2 minus 4 minus 8. Is 1 going to work? No. It's not going to work because the function value would be something other than 0. So 1's not going to work. What else should we try? Let's try negative 1. Now, um, in my opinion, it's usually not worth plugging in a negative 1 in here to see. Because you're going to have to you're going to have to cube it, square it, raise it to the fourth, whatever, multiply it by a number out front. It's a little hard to keep track of all the negatives. So one is easy to check. Negative one, not too bad. If you want to check it the way we did that last one, I'm going to check this one using synthetic division. So I'm going to put a negative one in the box, and I'm going to do a one, a negative one, a two, a negative four, and a negative eight. Draw, oops, draw that little line. Put that little box there. Bring down, multiply, combine, add, multiply, combine, multiply, combine, oops, negative, negative 8. This is going to be positive 8, and that's going to be a 0. We good there? So, okay, watch. What does that mean about this? Okay, let's make sure we keep the names right. That means this is a zero, or used interchangeably, an x-intercept, a root, a solution, however you want to call it. Okay, that means that we know what one of the factors is. One of the factors is x plus one. X plus one. Very good. Now, what is this stuff right here, now that we've got a name for it? That's the depressed polynomial, and it's depressed because it's going to start out at degree what? Cubed. 2x squared, 4x minus 8. Now, I'm going to blow this up. I want you to take a good look. Take a good look at that depressed polynomial. What's the degree? It's degree 3. How many terms does it have? Four terms. Now, we've said numerous times, if you're going to solve an equation, especially a quadratic, the easiest way to solve it is if you can factor it. Well, the same is true if it's a degree 3 polynomial. We call it a cubic polynomial. Okay? So if we looked at that just for a second, could we factor it? Now, before you answer that, okay, you've got that on your paper. I'm going to slide this up here, and we're going to take a look at this one. This one had four terms, and we looked at it for a little bit yesterday, and we figured out, you know what? I can't factor that. So we had to use this approach until we got to one that we could factor. Let's take a look at this one again. Can that factor? Yes. By what method? Grouping. Grouping. So I'm going to take out an x squared. I'm left with an x minus 2. I'm going to take out, what am I going to take out? I'm going to take out a positive 4. Again, you have to write that sign, and I'm left with an x minus 2. So what I get is, I get x minus 2, and what's left to with is an x squared plus 4. Now, if you wanted to call this, is everybody watching? If you wanted to call this a depressed polynomial, that would be okay. Smaller, a little easier to work with. Am I forgetting anything right here? Okay, I'm forgetting that x plus 1, so let's bring that back. Whoops, x plus 1. Thank you. Give me just a second, Zach. I'm entitled to screw up and fix my own screw-ups. Okay. Okay, now, how many zeros were we looking for? We were looking for four. How many do I have so far? Okay, I've got, watch carefully, I've got this one, which we pointed out over here. What's the one that comes from here? Two. Now, 
Somebody tell me something nice about this one. Okay, I'll take square rootable. That's an interesting word, but I'll take square rootable. Okay, it is a quadratic. Once you get to the point where it's a quadratic, if the depressed polynomial is a quadratic, you've got a ton of tools to work with. You can try and factor it. If it doesn't factor, we'd immediately go to the quadratic formula. Usually, this is a little bit of an odd duck because you can solve this by the square root property. So I want to know when does x squared plus 4 equal 0? If I move the 4 over to the other side, I get a negative 4. And if I solve this, I end up with plus or minus square root of negative 4. That's going to be... 2i. Now, take a good look at this. Imaginary. It's imaginary. Do I get any real answers from this? I don't. I get two imaginary answers. Let's look at the instructions. Real. It's just these two. These are the only two real ones. These are the only two real ones. These two, and there are two, aren't there? Those are imaginary. Okay, now, if that wasn't too bad, that's what 5.6 is like. That's about the only thing we add. Say we're going to find all the zeros, real ones and imaginary ones. We call them complex zeros. Find all the complex zeros. Okay. This one just said real. 5.5 .5 is about finding real zeros. So in how many places, careful here, in how many places does this graph cross the x-axis? Only two. Only two. It only crosses right here and right here. At negative 1 on the x-axis, and at positive 2 on the x-axis. By the way, does it touch across at these places? It crosses because the multiplicity is 1. The multiplicity is odd. Okay, are there any questions? Sure? Okay, I'm, I'm serious. If you understand that, that's what 5.6 is like. We'd have to go all the way to here, and we'd include these. Two real ones and two imaginary ones. Any questions? Piece of cake? Okay, go ahead and flip the page over then. We're going to talk about a theorem. It's called the Intermediate Value Theorem. We actually use this. I mean, you're probably already familiar with this idea. Um, we actually talk about this again uh, if you were to take uh, calculus. Um, but here's the idea. If we've got a polynomial, now remember, polynomials are nice. We study them because they have lots of nice behavior. They're nice and smooth and they're always connected. Nothing weird happens on them. Okay. If we've got a polynomial, and if A is less than B, so in other words, A is on the left, B is on the right. And if A and B are opposite signs, or F of A and F of B are opposite signs, so one's down here and one's up here, for example, then it says there is at least one real zero in between A and B. So if you've used a graphing calculator very much, we, we do this a lot of the time, we figure out, hey, I've got a point that's lower than the x-axis. I've got a point that's above the x-axis. Somewhere in, bet in between there, it's got to hit zero. Okay? Because if I go from the negatives to the positives, I've got to pass through zero. And that would create a zero. Okay? So I cross the x-axis. That's an x-intercept. And that's what we'd call a zero. Now, it works the other way, too. What if f of a was up here and f of b was down here? Is there any way to get from here to here without crossing through the x-axis? No. Could it do this? Everybody watch. It could. Remember it says at least one real zero. At least one. It doesn't have to say it can only have one. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So here's some things that you want to think about. If a polynomial is of odd degree, what is its end behavior? What does it look like? So where does it start and where does it end? Okay, so it usually starts down here and ends up here, right? Okay, well look at this in the context of this problem. If it starts down here and ends up here, doesn't it have to cross the x-axis? Yeah. Even if it had a negative in front of it and it started up here and ended down here, wouldn't it have to cross through the x-axis? Yeah, at least once, okay? So this is a little theorem, and this is the idea behind the theorem, what we just talked about. A polynomial with real coefficients and odd degree has at least one real zero. All that's saying is you can't get from down here to up here 
without crossing the x-axis, or vice versa. You can't get from up here to down here without crossing the x-axis at least once. Okay? So, this means that if we have an odd degree polynomial, we're guaranteed at least one real zero. So, if we're working with a degree 7 polynomial, we're guaranteed we can find one real zero. Do we have the same guarantee if it's even? We don't. Okay? Can somebody give me an example of one? Zach? Mm -hmm. it never it. Yep. So vertex above the x-axis and opens up. Starts up here and ends up here. Never goes below the x-axis. Okay. We don't get the same guarantee. All right. And then the last theorem from this section, it says every polynomial with real coefficients can be uniquely factored into a product of linear factors. These are the nice ones, kind of like x minus c, stuff like that. Or you could have a number in front of that. It really wouldn't matter. Or an irreducible quadratic. Okay, an irreducible quadratic is one where we'd have to use the quadratic formula or like the one that we did here that was x squared plus 4. Okay, so one where you have to use the quadratic formula or the square root property. Usually, we end up using um, the, the quadratic formula. Okay, all right. Any questions? Again, all this does is guarantee we can factor the polynomial into linear factors or a quadratic might be left. Maybe a couple quadratics, but we can use the quadratic formula there. Okay? Any questions? Okay, we'll look at two more examples, and then we'll be done with this section. So it says on 78, use the intermediate value theorem to show that the polynomial has a zero on the given interval. So if you start at negative 1 on the x-axis and go to zero on the x-axis, we want to check to see whether or not this has, crosses the x-axis in between. Okay. Somebody know what to do here? Plug them in. Good idea. So let's figure out what is f of negative 1. Well, that would be 1 minus 8 minus 1 plus 2. What's our value? What's our function value? Negative 6. Negative 6? Okay. Okay, I, I love all the guesses. That's fabulous. We're still working on arithmetic, apparently. Um, what's the big deal here? Do we care about the 6? Not as much we care about as, as we care about the negative. The fact that it's negative means it's below the x-axis. Okay, let's figure out what f of 0 is. Is that tough? Piece of cake. It's 2. So what this means is we start at negative 6 and we end up at 2. What has to happen in between negative 1 and 0? It's got to cross the x-axis. So must have 0 by intermediate value theorem. All we're saying is, look, I showed you the work. This one's negative. This one's positive. So by the intermediate value theorem, it's got to have a 0 in between there. Okay? Can I just say yes, it has a 0? Or do I have to say must have 0 by? Yeah, you can say that, and then I'll take off points. I'm just kidding. Yeah, that would be fine. I mean, you want to show this work. It's a little, I mean, it's a little bit weird. We're just seeing if you understand the idea behind the intermediate value theorem. If you were to do this correctly, you could say, do this, do this. Yes, it has a zero. Okay. And we'd get what you mean. But if you wanted to show that, you'd want to show one's negative, one's positive. Doesn't matter which is which. And then you'd say, well, by the intermediate value theorem, it guarantees us that it's got to cross the x-axis. You with me? Okay, last one, number 91. Graph the polynomial without the use of the calculator. Can't use one anyway. Use end behavior, the zeros and their multiplicity, and label all the intercepts. Now, you can look at this, and you can figure out at least one point on the graph. Negative 6, 0. Or 0, negative 6. Sorry. What is it? 0, negative 6. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, 0, negative 6. <laughs> Zero, negative six is on the graph because remember, if you plug in a zero, that's the easiest one to spot. Okay, now finding the x-intercepts, think about what we're asking here. We're at being asked to solve, find how many places this crosses the x-axis in. How many places could it cross in? Three. Three. Now take a good look at this. It's a four-term polynomial. Can you factor it? Nope, the only tool we have is to factor by grouping. 
at least from 1010, but now we're in 1050, we've got another tool. I can find factors, I can find zeros, and I can find the nice ones first. So we're going to do P and Q stuff. Now I'm going to write this, if you don't have to, what's my list? One, two, three, and six with pluses and minuses in front of them, right? There's my list of possibilities. There is no way they all work. But the ones that do work, that are nice and rational, are in that list. We're guaranteed that by the rational zeros theorem. What one do you want to check first? One. Okay, now take a good look here. If I plug in a one, any hope for a one? Nope. nope. Should we try negative one? Okay, let's try it. Negative 1, 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6. 1. Wouldn't that be a positive one? Oh, maybe you can find the solution. Yep. Nope. Negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 6, 6. Well, that works out great. Okay, what does that mean about this? Okay, that is a zero, which means it corresponds to a factor, and that factor is x plus 1. And what do I write here? x squared plus x minus 6. Now take a good look at this. What do you notice about it? It's pretty, it's a quadratic, and we've got tons of tools for working with quadratics. We did it in the last chapter. You did it a whole bunch in 1010. Uh, 10. So this factors even further. This is a nice, easy one. So I've got a factor of x plus 1 out front, and then I'm looking for numbers that multiply to be negative 6 and combine to be positive 1. Okay, so that's going to be positive 3 and negative 2. So... Let's keep track of the zeros. Kind of running out of space here. So zeros. Uh, let's see, I've got a 1, negative 1, a negative 3, and a 2, right? What's the multiplicity of every one of these? 1. one. Touch or cross? So will they cross in every one of them? Okay, now, going back to 5.1, looks... Like, looks like x cubed. So that means it's going to start down here and end up here. It's got to cross at negative 1, negative 3, and positive 2. You with me? Starts down here. Cross, what's up? Okay. Okay, watch. It's got to do this. Cross. Go like this. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Okay. What is this point right here? If I label that and label this and label this and label this, put arrows on the end, have I convinced people that I know what I'm doing? Yes. Yeah. Now, would it be better if we did this roughly to scale? Would it be better if I put tick marks on here and made it come down to there? So if I did that, and I'm going to change colors here, so maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, made it do this, and then I made my graph go here, here, and labeled that that way, and then did that. Would that be better? Would it be any more convincing that I know what I'm doing? Not, I don't think so. Not that I know what I'm doing. Maybe I'm a better artist and I've considered, yeah, there's, I mean, I should make it roughly to scale if I can. What if this was negative 106? That would not be fun to draw all the tick marks. It, it wouldn't be fun to draw all the tick marks. And the two axes wouldn't be to scale. So you'll notice that I don't put any tick marks on those axes. So you can kind of adjust it and make it look how it's supposed to. Okay. As long as you label the points right, you're going to be fine. Now, on this one, would it be worth the effort to make it to scale? 
Yes, but if this is a really big or a really small number, unless these are really big or really small, which you hope they're not, you're going to be much better off if you get the general shape, make sure you label those points correctly, and you're in business. Okay, very good questions. Anything else? Yeah. What do, you, what do you mean when X? Oh, do you have to figure out how high this goes? No, luckily not. If you wanted to, you could. I mean, that would just be more things in making a more accurate graph. But as far as this problem goes, does this show all the basic behavior? Goes through the right points, has the right shape, the right end behavior. We're in business. Okay? Anything else? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, let's do this. We're going to correct... Um, after we have the quiz. Is that okay? okay. Yeah.